My name is Jason Raber and this is my coworker Jason Cheatham. We work for the Air Force Research Laboratory, um, specifically for a, a branch called the SPI, stands for Software Protection Initiative. And our charter or goals are to assess software protections um, uh, and the, the end result is to protect government systems. Um, so to do that, to come up with good protections, uh, the team that I lead is a reverse engineering team and we really try to break those protections and understand how long a protection can hold from uh, three different categories, tampering, reverse engineering, and piracy. Okay. Um, and so today it, we're going to show you one of the tools that we use on assessing protections. We use a hardware debugger to, to walk through protections. Um, before I proceed, I, I got to state that uh, we cannot answer questions in a public forum or go off our already approved script. Due to the public approval process, we must stick to the script that has been approved for public release. One of the, the hardware debugger that we do use is the American Arium, and, um, and we'll get, kind of step you through and show you how to use an ICE effectively, again, to uh, break protections and also to kind of give a, a nice tutorial at least because when we were using it there was nothing so it was trial by fire. Okay so here's kind of the outline. Um, we'll give you a kind of a hardware and, break, uh, hardware and software breakdown of what it looks like, uh, the different types of breakpoints that you could use, um, some macros and then how to use it to actually uh, reverse engineer in, uh, a hypervisor. So this is a photo of uh, the American Arium ECM XTP3, which is just one of the more popular commercial uh, x86 in-circuit emulators or ICEs. Um, the emulator is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not really emulating anything. Um, it's just basically providing a JTAG port for you to use the uh, debugging facilities built into the CPU. So you know, using that though, you can do all kinds of neat things like uh, read memory, change registers, you know, things you can do with normal debuggers, plus some really interesting things like completely stop the processor um, and look at things you know, without having to worry about protections interfering with you. So uh, to use an in-circuit emulator, you need two systems. It's a little like a wind debug kind of remote setup. You need a target and a controller. Um, the ice gets plugged into both of them. Uh, the controller actually runs the debugging software. In our case, it's something called SourcePoint. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. And then uh, you actually have to plug it into the motherboard. If you are lucky, you'll have a motherboard with a JTAG port on it that you can just plug this thing right into and it's nice and clean and easy. But that's not really very common to find a commercial PC with a JTAG port on it. So what you usually end up having to do is use uh, an interposer. And an interposer is basically a little shim that goes in between the CPU and the socket that takes the JTAG pins and routes them out to a JTAG port. Uh, and that works well enough. It's just, uh, it's, it's kind of expensive. It, it costs about 20% of the cost of the entire, you know, emulator anyway. So the emulator is a $10,000, $11,000 piece of hardware. The, uh, the interposer is another 2000 on top of that just for this little shim. And uh, they're a little delicate too, you know, when you've got a CPU with like a, you know, five, six hundred pinball grid array, you, you can't really be plugging it and unplugging it from that socket a lot. So it's, 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 it's a delicate little system, but it, it works. It's good. Yes. All right, so there are some limitations to using the, like a kernel debugger like WinDebug or KDG for Linux. Um, for example, you know, with the, the the American Arium, we can, you know, reflash uh, the firmware, we can debug hypervisors, um, and also, again, walk through a lot more protections. Um, as Jason said before, you know, it's, it's kind of a steep price to, uh, you know, to buy one of these guys. Also, you need physical access. Um, but one of the kind of neat things I found is, um, you know, we're going to talk about some macros here in a minute, but you can write a lot of macros to work on. It's just an x86 essentially. So if we're reverse engineering some application on Linux or Windows, it really doesn't matter to us. It's just, you know, throwing on the system and then start debugging. It's kind of neat. Okay, so the, you know, the point of this is just to kind of show you what the um, actual debugger looks like. As you can see here, you know, you got both cores. So, you know, it can support up eight, eight cores. Um, Again, here's the memory, and you can modify this on the fly. You can even load 
anything you want, like a driver, right into the memory from here. Um, here's all the registers. Uh, and this is kind of the macro window. This is where, like I so said, we, we talk about customizing it to make it a little more efficient and better, kind of like wind debug. Okay, so let me talk about breakpoints. Uh, it's a little bit different than the normal breakpoints that we use for like wind debug. And again, that's, that's, that's some of the point here is it uses the DR registers, but it has um, it sets a bit in a DR7. Um, it's an undocumented flag, and when that hits, again, you just start debugging. But again, protections can detect this type of uh, breakpoint. Software breakpoints work a little bit different than you're used to with like Ali Debug or Immunity or, or um, GDB, where they're using CCs. In this case, they're using an um, ICEBP breakpoint. And again, the DR7 um, bit 12 needs to be set. And again, then once that um, trap has been uh, set, uh, it will replace the uh, F1 with the bytes that are stolen. You can start debugging. But the last one that we like the best is um, using an infinite loop. And you've probably seen, or a lot of you know what uh, the EBFE is. It's a jump dollar sign, which again um, loops to itself, and you just need to steal two bytes. Um, one thing that I found is, you know, you just can't you got to be a little bit careful when you're dealing with uh, protections, maybe in malware or in software. Um, you can't just throw an EBFE wherever you'd like um, because then they can detect that usually through checksums. So you might have to be smart depending on what kind of protection you're looking at. So a lot of times we'll put it in the actual loader in Windows or in, in Linux. Put the EBFE there. As the ap application starts up, it'll halt, and, you know, and then you can actually halt or it'll loop, and then you just hit halt on the um, hardware emulator, you can replace the stolen bytes and then start stepping. Um, we actually write little macros too that will do those very things and so and again for timing checks same thing you can hit a macro that when it hits stop it halts the actual hard or the hardware does halts the system and then we can pull off the RDTSC or something along those lines and then just start um, spoofing it. Another nice thing is, is like if you're debugging drivers or something along those lines, you don't have to figure out where Windows or, or Linux has loaded the driver and then do all the weird calc base uh, math, figuring out where the, the page table and the physical memory is. Um, you just hit halt. Sometimes when you hit halt, be aware that there will be a context switch maybe in the OS, so it won't hit in your EBFE. Just hit go and then hit stop again, and then you'll be right there. Okay, macros. So, a lot like other customizable debuggers, uh, SourcePoint has a macro engine. Uh, you can write macros to do all kinds of things. You can automate tasks. Uh, you can implement, you know, different functionality like stealthy breakpoints. Uh, and in this case, you know, for the case of the hardware debugger too, you can provide some OS, infor you know, s some semantic kind of information because by default, uh, the, the Arium system is very raw. You don't have, you know, I mean, you can't, for instance, just list processes in the operating system or list drivers, you know. You don't have access to structures like that because by default, you know, the, the controlling computer that's hooked up to the Arium, the only thing it knows about the target is that there's a CPU and memory. It knows nothing about what's in there. And so that makes it a little daunting at first to do anything with. And so macros can really help out there. The uh, language itself is an interpreted, you know, C-like language, a very simple, standard kind of imperative uh, macro language. It's got all the normal kind of features, variables, functions, control flow, um, and a few hardware-specific things to, like, stop uh, the emulator and start it back up again, set break, you know, breakpoints. So this is a simple example script on the right. We have a little script that just illustrates some of the standard language features. You know, we're defining a function. It takes arguments. You can type the arguments. Um, you know, infinite while loop that's actually looking at the EIP register to, you know, make decisions about what to do. Um, in this case, it's basically a memory range breakpoint. You call the function, you give it a start address, you give it an end address, and then you say go, and then it will basically just step until it gets into the proper address range and stop. It's, you know, it's not particularly fast. Um, you know, we're stepping four instructions at a time to make it a little faster but it's better than doing it by hand and sitting there hitting the button over and over again. So this is just a real short video of uh, this breakpoint running, just to give you a feel of how things kind of work in SourcePoint. Uh, basically, you stop the emulator, you know, it halts until, you know, again, just like a regular debugger, it tells you where you are. Uh, you know, I used it in, well, you can't really read that all that well, can you? 
Well, anyway, so basically you, you stop it on an EBFE like Jason was talking about, an infinite loop. Uh, you put your bytes back, you, you know, type in the macro in the little, uh, you know, in the command area, hit go, it runs, and there you go. It does what you'd expect, and then it stops, and then you can start debugging. So, oh, yes, also, awesomely tiny text. This is, you know, another example macro. In this case, it's like a run trace. And the macro language also gives you access to things like files. So you can open a file, you can, you know, run a trace, and you can log information out to a file. Uh, in this case, you know, we can also do things like uh, try to avoid stepping through kernel code. Um, like the macro will actually pay attention to the address range you're in, and it says, oh, if I just step from user code into something that looks like kernel code just based on address range, well, set some breakpoints afterwards and go. Don't bother to step through kernel code because even with the emulator, you know, sometimes you'll blue screen your target. So the emulator access, like I said before, is pretty raw. You don't really have anything when you start out. You, you can't really do any of your general generic uh, debugger things. Like you can't just list processes and attach to one and start debugging it. So we wrote a whole bunch of little macros um, that are developed, in our case, for Windows XP Service Pack 3. They'll probably work with other XPs, but they're fairly specific because they're basically using a lot of uh, forensic kind of techniques to look through memory and find structures, and those change a lot between versions of Windows. So, you know, first question, you know, when I opened this up was, you know, how the heck do I attach to a process? And so... You know, standard kind of forensic technique is to look for some known structures and memories, find the process list, and be able to walk through it, and, you know, then you can find the processes. And so, you know, I wrote a list prox macro, and that was basically my first step is, you know, find these things. Um, so if you look at them, you, know, you want to, you know, also be able to change things. So there, you know, we wrote a hook syscall macro, a get system service descriptor table macro, um, you know, similar things for drivers because uh, the emulator is really good for that uh, because, again, you can do things like set breakpoints in the kernel or in drivers and not have to worry about things freezing um, because you're sort of running outside the system. And so, uh, you know, I wrote like a list modules macro that, you know, lists all the drivers. And there's a, you know, we've written several other simple macros, but the idea is basically, you know, you can use these simple macros to give this, this fairly raw system a lot of uh, user, fun you know, user-friendly functionality. So again, kind of a short, you know, video that's basically, this is what we can do with macros. You load your macro library in the command prompt, you get a bunch of functions, uh, you know, again, like list mods or list processes, you know, you can call them again. It's, it's basically, you know, just like, a, just like doing it in all your wind debug with custom macros. So just to look in a little more detail about uh, what exactly we're doing with these functions, you know, I'm going to look at the get syscall address macro just to show you kind of how we're doing this in this, uh, you know, with, with this emulator, how we're actually looking at the system. So in this case, you know, we're going to have a top level function and it's get syscall address because that's what we want to do. And you're going to give it a name like mt create process and you want it to tell you, you know, what's the address on my target system. And so, you know, one kind of a main component in that is this function that's SST, SSDT index to address. So uh, we're going to get our name, we're going to get an index for it, and then we want to say, well, what's the address? So that works okay. That's just get a pointer to the base of the system service descriptor table, you know, and based on your index, tell you what the address of your particular uh, function is. Well, that seems easy. But uh, where do we actually get the address of the descriptor table? And that's, you know, things start to get a little more interesting there, and this is where I was really digging through, like, the source code to volatility. Uh, which is a Python framework for doing forensics. So in that case, you know, the Arium, again, you don't have exported symbols to look at uh, because you're not really running inside the operating system. And so uh, I'm looking for a Windows GDI process, and then I'm going to pull the pointer to the system, the system service descriptor table out of that, out of its ethread structure. So finding a GDI process is really kind of the biggest pain in the butt. And so in that case, you have to find uh, the head of the process list uh, which in this case is a very XP-centric thing. I'm doing, looking for the KPCR structure, which is always in a known location in XP, and from there, get the head of the active process list and walk through it. Uh, and each process, you just look to see uh, what its Win32 process field value is, and, you know, when you find the right, you know, when basically a GDI process has one value, and there you go. So once you find the GDI process, you can just go into its ethread structure and pull out the, uh, the address of the system service descriptor table. So again, you know, putting together little building blocks like this, you know, you get a lot of good, useful functionality out of this. So 
You know, one of my first thoughts when I 